03 just had a massive price decrease. So I've been spending some time trying to dig into this model to see, is it something that I could actually consider or recommend as a daily driver, as a coding model? Traditionally for me, reasoning models are not my favorite, like daily drivers. They're slower, they typically don't follow tool calls as well, and they just don't work as good with agentic tools. But in this case, the price has gotten to the point now where it's worth considering. A few things to note here is that it's about two thirds the price of Claude on the input price. It's about 53% on the output price, and it's a little bit more expensive on the cash read, but there are no writing. Like, so uh, Claude 4 actually charges you $3.75 to write to cash. I don't see any indication that O3 does anything similar to that. So it is substantially cheaper than Claude Sonnet 4. Now, a couple other points of that is it does have a 200,000 uh, token context window, just like Claude, and it has a knowledge cutoff of May 31st, 2024. So about a year, a little over a year now of knowledge cutoff. And I was very excited to dig into this until I got in and I started finding with Rue code in particular, I could never get it to work with anything complex. Now, if I'm doing like one off things or something little here, it works. It's fine. But what I want to do is I actually want to be able to do these larger uh, multi file things, especially in this case, I want to be able to do something a little bit bigger. So I could never get any of my evals to actually complete with my normal flow. And that's a little bit unfortunate because I think O3, because of the price coming down, I was actually pretty excited to see kind of how it ranks. But the problem is I can't get a consistent enough ranking to actually determine if it's good or not. Klein has the exact same problem, which, you know, it's to be understandable. Uh, Rucode is forked from Klein and those two have kind of stayed in sync a little bit, you know, adding features back and forth to one another. They have very similar methods for calling tools and, and stuff like that. Windsurf, on the other hand, actually did kind of complete an application. I did not see a lot of failures, but it honestly, even after iterating over it multiple times, the eval scores were just rock bottom. They were really, really, really poor. And I got to thinking, like, why is this the case? So then as I was like eating lunch at the time, I was thinking, what about Codex? So... Let me go talk about Codex CLI. Now, this isn't the remote agent Codex. This is Codex CLI. So I hadn't loaded this up in a while, and I was like, what if O3 is just going to be, like, killer in Codex CLI? So the things I wanted to look at, is it going to call tools well? Is it going to follow instructions well? And ultimately, I kicked off a really big refactor that I wanted to have done. So I worked together. I worked to get the prompt good and, and did everything I needed there. And I went ahead and kicked it off. So Codex has actually come a long way. So I'm pretty excited to actually dig into this a little bit more. Some really weird things to me is like one of the first commands it did was literally deleting my current file. And I was like, why would it just delete my file? And it ran that several times. So it was delete that file, delete that file, delete that file. Again, I don't know the inner workings of Codex. But to me, this felt very fishy, and I was very worried kind of what the out, you know, the, the output of this was going to be. And then what it ended up doing is it moved on to, all right, I need to work on the event names. And so it broke everything up pretty well. And at this point, I actually felt like it was doing a reasonably good job until I saw stuff like this again, where it appears that we're basically doing uh, apply patches with very similar... Uh, patches, you know, for the input. So very, very odd there again. And what I found after this ran is that we actually ended up with an error where there was duplicate closing script tags. So it ended up being kind of a bit of a mess. It even claimed that. But it just kept going and eventually it worked through that and got it working. Then I found that it was doing stuff like this. So it was like thinking about renaming the components that it had already made to add.ts.view and this also was interesting because I like that it did that because my, my standard is .ts.view. I didn't like that they was adding it as .view, but it still was weird because it deleted my main file 
and it was gone. It had created a new version of that file named .view, and then it had created a bunch of components uh, named .view, and now it's determining that it wants to rename it. So it starts going through that. The first version, very broken, kind of standard for a big refactor, to be honest. Um, I ended up iterating over it. It apologized very nicely, but it didn't actually change anything. Um, so it said it made some changes, but it actually didn't. Just to show you here, for example, uh, after I kind of had iterated over a little bit, it ended up undoing that delete and basically modifying the exi existing file. So at one point, this file was deleted and there was a dot view one. And these are all the new components that they've done. And to be fair, I think these are fairly decently broken up. Um, they're pretty much in line with what I had kind of told it. I didn't expect these three to be separate. I was expecting that to be a single component, but I'm also not, a, not opposed to them being separate components. Uh, it did also take my eye icon that I had as an SVG in there and put it into its own component. Same with the warning icon. Thought that was kind of cool, uh, to be honest. It was something I actually didn't tell it to do either. Now, it ended up moving forward and I did another iteration on it and then it nailed it. So we were in a place where like it actually, everything worked. I went through all the tests um, and everything was good. So I don't know how this would have compared with Claude, uh, like Claude Code, for example, but I will say the Codex CLI has come along a, a lot for me. This was a very smooth feeling, execution. O3 seemed to do a pretty good job. It just did some odd things, but it eventually got to where it needed to be to get it working. I just paid for some tokens that honestly I wish I wouldn't have paid for. Um, but if they opened up Codex as part of my pro plan, for example, and allowed me to kind of iterate through stuff, man, I'd love to put these side by side with Claw Code and kind of see how that kind of works. But, you know, here you're paying for every API call, every token that you're burning. That I have a hook to my API. Now, let me go down here and just kind of talk a little bit about, so what is it good for? So now Eric, who's the creator of Repo Prompt, which is something I've actually started playing around with a little bit so I get my hands around it. I am by no means an expert at it, but I will say it works incredibly well with Repo Prompt. Now, the thing that he's replying to here is someone says O3 is a research model. And after all of the experimentation and testing that I've done, I actually, I think I agree with that. I don't think I put O3 as the best coding model for the way that I like to use them. And I, I don't even think that it would be the best model with Codex CLI just due to the odd things that it ended up doing. Uh, but again, that I don't know if that's the nature of Codex CLI or the model itself, usually more the model in that particular case for the decisions that are being made. But repo prompts an interesting one. It's a Mac native application that basically allows you to, uh, you can use O3, for example, I've actually linked O3 to it and I was kind of talking to it, getting some refactors done, but it's not an agentic coding tool. It's more of like a one-off prompt that you do. You, you can kind of compose and like set some instructions together. You can uh, add like an architect prompt to it. You can add your files that you want to have as context. And then you kick it off with a chat that you do. So here, you can see here, I've got my compose in my chat. And it works relatively well. Um, I do not have the pro version of Repo Prompt because it's, right now it's just not my favorite workflow. I need to think about that a little bit more. But it's a very interesting workflow. And I could see people wanting to use this, especially if they are doing things like in, they're trying to keep cost really low and they don't want to hook to an API and they just want to do it all through copy and pasting to a web application. This is kind of an interesting tool for that. So I don't think this is correct that O3 is the best coding model for the way I use it. I think it might be the best coding model for repo prompt based on what Eric is saying here. And I have no evidence to say otherwise there. So for me, what I've thought about is like what it's really for is researching. And I've landed on O3 as being just a really good research model. And I had a really interesting problem that I've been kind of working through. And I was out on the boat Friday. And as I was on the boat, I started thinking about this problem. And this is terrible, but I can't get work out of my head. So I was thinking about this problem. So I wrote up a couple uh, sentences of this thing, tried to give it as much information as I could, you know, type it on a mobile phone. And I sent it to O3 and O3 Pro. 
O3 uh, thought for 13 seconds and O3 Pro uh, thought for 13 minutes and three seconds. And honestly, this got me to a point. So by the time I got home, I actually had a plan for how I was going to implement this with Claude Code. And it was very, very helpful. Because, you know, sometimes you just need to step away from a problem or talk through it a bunch. And it did a really good job kind of finding and getting to a point where I was like, this this is a bad idea, this is a bad idea, this is a pretty good idea. And ultimately, I was able to implement a solution that I think is like, you know, it's better than what I had before. It's not perfect yet, but it, it at least moves me in the right direction. So you can kind of see the difference here between O3 and O3 Pro. Uh, they're very similar, very, very similar uh, responses here. So the, the quick wins from hours to a day, and then it had a second part. And then there was like a second part, which was a little bit long, and then a structural rethink. Ultimately, I ended up like talking to it a bit more, having some conversation about it. And it ended up, like I said, landing in a really good spot. I found O3 Pro not to be very useful for me for a brainstorming type situation, which is what I'd want for code uh, coding. But if I was doing some kind of like massive like documentation that I needed to generate. O3 Pro is great for that if I don't care about the timing. But O3 was quick enough that I could actually have a conversation back and forth. So I ended up abandoning my O3 Pro one because even the follow-up questions were taking 14, 15 minutes. It was, just, it was kind of painful to wait for that. I just don't see many use cases for O3 Pro beyond maybe like a big feature you're trying to roll out and you have a bunch of stuff you need to jam into context and then you can kind of let it rip through that at that point. Now, I got to thinking a little bit about root code and their architect mode. And again, the model just kind of makes things up. So here it says it's a 4,000 line single file component with low readability and maintainability. It's actually 1,304, so it's not even in the same ballpark there. But I did want to, I do want this to be refactored. Uh, so it's just very fascinating to me, like even in root code, the kind of disconnect there. But to be fair, it wasn't a terrible plan here. It was not nearly as good as the Codex CLI one, though. Uh, the Codex CLI one did like a really nice separation of things, where in this one, I basically wanted it to give me ideas on how to refactor. And it didn't give me as good of a, a idea as I was kind of expecting there. And ultimately, um, I ended up abandoning the root code one, and I've gone forward with the Codex CLI one at this point. And the final thing that I think I'm going to use O3 for is analysis. So, for example, I had a huge conversation uh, that basically I had a frustrated customer, and I want to make sure that I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of streamline what my AI is doing to help people understand kind of how to navigate, how to talk to it. Um, so anyway... Basically, I took a lot of that conversation and I asked, basically, can you help me make changes to my prompt so that I can answer these questions better? Because we have a lot of data, but they were asking about it in different formats and different ways that, you know, the AI wasn't answering it very good. So I ended up asking it. And this the, the suggestions here were fantastic. And it only took six seconds to think through this. I also did this one to O3 Pro. And again, I don't think the quality difference is so much better in O3 Pro for things like this that it's worth like waiting for all of that time. So yeah, that's sort of where I've landed on O3 at this point. I am super sad that I can't test this as like a daily coding agent without using Codex CLI because even in Windsurf, it's just not good enough um, as an agentic tool for complex things. I did actually use it for like simple strategic uh surgical things and it, it does fine at that but it's hard for me to say that i just use claude 4 at that point because i think it's just as fine uh and i think it's faster because o3 even though it is fast it is still slower than claude 4 in in my testing so it is exceptionally cool that OpenAI did reduce the price of this by 80 percent it puts it into the realm of something that i could recommend using for any sort of architecting or planning heck it might even become my architect in my root code implementation and try to run run that in the micromanager and see how that actually plays out. But for now, I just can't figure out a way to make this thing my daily coding model.
But if you are using something like repo prompt, it seems like that it seems to be a good place to actually use it. So I've heard mixed results. I've heard people say they love it as a coding model, and I've heard people say it you know, doesn't work great in AI coding tools. Unfortunately, I fall on the it doesn't work great on AI coding tools, but I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it in the web browser. And I love doing it uh, in Codex CLI. I felt like that was a really great experience. So anyway, I do think if OpenAI were to ever attach my pro plan to Codex CLI, I would give that a bit more of a run because it has come a long way. And the fact that it's open source is kind of cool too. Because I actually want to actually go into that repo and kind of dig into how they're doing things a little bit, especially on the tool calling side. I think that would be very interesting, especially because O3 works so much better there than it did in Ruby code. I'm curious to see kind of the optimization techniques they used on that side. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you've had a chance to try out O3, if you found a way to get it to work well in some of these AI assisted coding tools, let me know. But I even, I've tried it in others and it was very much the same story across the board, unfortunately for me. Till next time, everyone. I hope you guys all have a fantastic day. Peace out.